I have a mission first, a job second. Got it? And here's how that played out. A person would say something like this. I have a, a mission first, and oh, by the way, I do a little marketing on the side. I have a mission first, and oh, by the way, I do a little accounting or human resources on the side. Once we started people thinking that way, it was no longer my turf, my department, my budget, my employees. No, that, that, that turf went away because they were thinking we have a greater mission here to accomplish, which is the, the good of the entity. That was the first part. The second thing we need to do is teach the skills, the competencies of these best practices to accelerate this change process. In the book Good to Great, Jim Collins refers to those leaders who have transformed a company from good to great as a level five leader. One successful CEO referred to Kurt Southam as a level five leader. Kurt has helped many organizations tap higher levels of discretionary effort to enjoy a significant competitive advantage. His combination of solid academic credentials, his in-the-trenches track record as a seasoned corporate executive, and his ability to create high trust with those he coaches sets him apart. Kurt does not just speak about effective leadership, he models it. Join me in welcoming Dr. Kurt D. Sauter. Good afternoon, good being with you today. Forty percent of all employees do just enough to avoid getting reprimanded or terminated. Forty percent. That's a research study done by Jan Kelevich. When he did that study, it caught the attention of many executives and managers, and their response is, well, just give you better employees. Well, that's true, that's part of the solution, but it's not the whole, and it's, it's analogous to the thinking of the governor of the state who approached the warden of the largest prison in his state system. And he said, I don't get this. You have people coming into prison, they spend uh, five or ten years, they go through your rehab, through your counseling, even educational training, they go out, commit a similar crime, and come back. You've got to do something to solve this problem. And the warden spoke up and said, I got the solution. And the, the governor said, what is it? He said, send me better quality prisoners. <laughs> well... <clears throat> That simplistic thinking often is uh, similar to what we see in management too, just give you better quality employees. We found it's much more complex than that and it takes a little bit more involved thinking on that. For example, when I was in graduate school I had some really wonderful professors. They were just remarkable in the areas of management. And I recall frequently sitting in a class and I heard this phrase, if you're going to affect long-term cult uh, cultural change, you better plan on about three to five years. I remember thinking, I don't know how many boards of directors are going to sit by and wait three, four, five years for a change to occur. They won't do that. They don't have that tolerance for patience and time. They just don't have that. And with that in mind, I went on this quest to say, can you bring about a faster corporate change for the good to help all employees to transform an organization in less than three to five years? That was my goal. And through a lot of experimentation and, and doing things by watching best practices of very qualified leaders, I discovered it doesn't take that long. And so we started making significant changes in large, large corporations, Fortune 100 corporations, by transforming them in some remarkable ways. And it didn't take three to five years. Well, there was a company that took note of this. They approached me and they said, would you like to uh, come on as a director of our board and maybe bring some best practices along with you? And I said, I'd be happy to serve on your board, which I did. And after a few board meetings, I asked questions about discretionary effort, about blurring the lines between departments, about some other kinds of things. I must have been asking the wrong questions because they asked if I wanted to be president of the corporation. I said, well, let me think about that. So I talked to my family, my wife and my six daughters, and I said, yeah, that's six, that's six. And I said, do you plan on a relocation? He said, let's do it. And so we, we packed up, we moved, we relocated, and we accepted that position. Oh, by the way, the one nice thing about having all daughters in Ohio, you know how it gets cold in the winter? We never turn the furnace on once. We just heat the house with curling irons and blow dryers. That's <laughs> absolutely sufficient. But we made the move, and it was fun, fun because we got all the team together, and we said, let's, let's form this team and get it going. And uh, basically, we imported the best practices of leadership teams and groups that we'd seen in lots and lots of industries. We transformed the industry. It was really fun because in that, in that group... We had an interesting mindset that we had to change, and I came out like this. The first thing I wanted to do is change the thinking of everyone said, from now on, I want you to think like this. I have a mission first, a job second. Got it? And here's how that played out. A person would say something like this. I have a, a mission first, and oh, by the way, I do a little marketing on the side. I have a mission first, and oh, by the way, I do a little accounting or human resources on the side. Once we started people thinking that way, it was no longer my turf, my department, my budget, my employees. No, that, that, that turf went away because they were thinking we have a greater mission here to accomplish, which is the, the good of the entity. That was the first part. The second thing we need to do is teach the skills, the competencies of these best practices to accelerate this change process. By the way, this company was not a bad company. By all measures, it was good. Not great, not terrible, but it's good. It was okay. And so we started to track the measures and started getting people to learn the skills of the best practices as we taught them. 
interesting things started to happen. Change happened very rapidly because we were tapping into these higher levels of discretionary effort. All this brain power and commitment and so forth was kind of laying fallow, but now it's being tapped in some very interesting ways. What was the upshot? The change started immediately. We, we tracked it over six years. We had the highest retention in our industry, the highest morale by measures. The governor of the state gave us two awards for premier quality when only four were granted in the state at the time. Pretty exciting. Oh, it gets better than that. Our management team was able to triple net income and increase the stock value 381%. Do the math. These are not soft skills. These are powerful, hard skills that really make a difference. So what we were finding is, people said, this is pretty exciting stuff, and it's sustained over a long time. So in this industry, people said, can you teach us what you know? I'd be happy to do so. What we found, we could export and import those skills to other kinds of organizations, they learned them. Now, let me fast forward or go back in time with four researchers that I've worked with for a long, long time. Wonderful gentlemen, they asked this question, how do you identify best practices? Here's the methodology. They would go into an organization and they say, who is it that's highly influential? They're well respected, they get results, and they're highly regarded. Who is that person? People would write the name down on a survey or tell them in person, and then they would add up the, the tally the votes. If a person got five or six votes, they threw it out of the study because it wasn't of much consequence. But if a person was considered a high influencer by 20, 25, 30 people, they knew they had the real deal. You can't fool 30 people. Then they'd walk up to them and say, may we follow you around and see what you do. Somehow, you get results. And you're well regarded. You're a high influencer. They watched those individuals. They studied them in performance reviews, with tough issues, with subordinates, peers, customers, whatever. They handled those situations much differently than everyone else. They wrote it down. How long did it take? They observed 25,000 high influencers over a period of 20 years no small study. They captured the information, boiled it down, wrote it up, and published it in the New York Times best-selling book called Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. These are one of the, this is one of the key tools we use in the change process. Does it make a difference? Let me tell you about one not long ago. We were working with a company that was kind of okay. Not great, not terrible, just kind of okay. We measured the, we did a cultural assessment profile. We measured the culture with some of our metric tools. Pretty exciting stuff we find out. And then we measure the individual competencies and skills of the leadership team. Then we put in the skills, the training of how we're going to get this higher level by teaching the skills of how do you have a crucial conversation. That is, you create a culture of accountability. If you say it, you do it. If you don't, you're going to be held accountable in a highly respectful way, but a highly candid manner. We don't dance around the issues. We teach people high candor and high respect. That's what we found. But people are expected to perform, and they do. What happened in this organization? They didn't have three to five years to make a change. I can guarantee you. But we put in the quarterly measures with the training, the individual executive coaching as a part of that process and the training. After nine months, when we did that quarterly review, we found that all the metrics we were measuring were pretty exciting, going in the right direction in a rapid way. I might tell you, Two of the vice presidents, we did one review after nine months, there were a few tears in the room because they could not believe how much it improved in this organization than before. Here's what used to happen. People would be in a meeting, they'd smile, nod at the CEO, and then go out in the parking lot and say, can you believe he said that? I can't believe he said that. That's what I call a parking lot veto. That kind of stuff was going on. I'm sure you've never seen that in your organization. Mm -hmm. The other thing was happening is people would come the same agenda item week after week, but it was never resolved. No one was holding people accountable for delivering on commitments. That was happening, but not anymore. There was a tr culture of trust being established. People were stepping up to the right conversations. Really exciting stuff. Well, now, let me just kind of conclude with a couple of thoughts that you might want to consider. <clears throat> the exciting thing about tapping higher levels of discretionary effort, it goes like this. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity out there. When you have people learn that I have a mission first, a job second, we tap them with the right skills, we teach the best practices of leadership. It gets pretty exciting. I believe that effective leadership is this. It's what your employees do when you're not there. I really believe that. As a corollary, I believe that effective parenting is what your children do when you're not there. <laughs> I believe that. Now, here's what I'd suggest to you. If you want to have a very fulfilling experience, tap those higher levels of discretionary effort. Tap them. That is where the action is. That will give you the strategic competitive advantage It'll kind of do something inside of you because you're now recognizing people and valuing them, not only for what they do, but for who they are. And all of a sudden, they're blossoming. They're taking off. If we could do it there, you can do it there, too. We can show you the skills. It's exciting because we can no longer sit back and just think it's going to be okay. My challenge to you is 
tap those higher levels of discretionary effort, that's today's silver bullet. Thank you.